Um, my name is uh, Dr. Vemur Murthy. I'm the chairman of the RP Webinar CME Committee and uh, the program director. And before I introduce the topic, the moderator as well as our distinguished speaker, uh, I will have our president, Dr. Sudhakar Jarlagarda. I have some few announcements. So uh, thank Dr. you, Dr. Mumuthi, for, for excellent. Uh, um, friends, you know, I'm so delighted to announce that, you know, uh, the 39th RP convention is going to be in Atlanta, uh, June 2nd and 3rd. And uh, please mark your calendar. And unfortunately, we have uh, problems in uh, doing in Orlando with the hotel. So our, as per the advice from the, our uh, council, we moved to Atlanta. And uh, it's going to be, the flight is going to go tomorrow. And uh, we are working hard. The local team, the Georgia Association of Physicians of Indian Origin, working very hard to make this event very successful. And uh, please participate. It's going to be for 500 people cap, not going to take more than 500. It's going to be the social distance and uh, in the 1500 capacity ballroom. And we try to do some of the activities on the outdoors so that uh, please come and join Atlanta and make this event very successful and memorable. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Muth. Thank you, Dr. John Lagarda. Yeah, today's CMA program is Peripartum Anxiety and Depression, a Silent Epidemic, Public Health Urgency, and Global Impact. Depression during pregnancy and postpartum period is relatively common and it has significant adverse effects on mother as well as the child. It affects approximately 11.5% of new mothers annually in the United States. This is not just a problem in US women. The reported rate for perinatal depression in low and middle income countries is as high as 49%. So by the end of this presentation, uh, we should be able to understand the high incidence and prevalence of anxiety and depressive symptoms during pregnancy and postpartum period, recognize the barriers to depression screening implementation, and understand interventions needed to decrease anxiety and depression incidence, and finally, recognize the impact of depression and anxiety on mother and child all over the world, both short term as well as the long term. So today's program is accredited for one hour of AMA, category one CMA credit by the Chicago Medical Society. Please use the chat line for question and answer session. The program will be moderated by Dr. Radhika Chimata, a psychiatrist with Goldstein practice and a faculty and instructor at the Loretta Hospital and attending psychiatrist Streamwood Behavioral Health Science Services, Streamwood, Illinois. We welcome you, Dr. Chimata. Today's distinguished speaker, Dr. Rohit Kumar Wasa, is well known to the membership of API for his contributions to the organization over many years in different capacities and currently serving API as co-chair of the CME webinar committee. Dr. Wasa is an attending neonatologist Anne and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital, Chicago, in the Department of Pediatrics, Northwestern University, Feinberg School of Medicine, Chicago, and Chair, Department of Pediatrics, and Site Leader for Neonatology, Mercy Hospital and Medical Center, Chicago. Postpartum and peripartum depression is one of his key areas of interest. He has 15 plus years of interest towards educating medical community about pediatric perspectives of postpartum depression and promoting routine screening for depression during pregnancy and postpartum period. Based on research conducted by his team on the incidence of depression among the mothers of, mothers of babies in special care nursery at Mercy, routine screening was initiated for these mothers eight years ago and is still ongoing, a commendable job. So based on, uh, he collaborated with several teams in the state of Gujarat, India, to increase awareness of depression during pregnancy and postpartum period. I'm personally aware of his passionate work. He is involved with the groundbreaking pilot project of saving children's lives of the American Heart Association in Gujarat. 
Dr. Vasa has several publications to his credit in peer-reviewed journals, wrote book chapters, and presented his work at national and international meetings. It's my pleasure to invite Dr. Rohit Kumar Vasa as our distinguished speaker. Dr. Vasa. Is uh, in a conventional way, but they are still celebrities because they uh, shared their public, they shared their personal stories to the public in order to uh, help other women uh, and moms with the depression. So the first one is of a case, uh, name of the person is Jennifer Hurtling and there are no violations here. Uh, um, and she delivered a baby and uh, had a postpartum bleeding, had problems with breastfeeding, weakness, developed depression, got psychiatric consult, got admitted in the hospital, got placed on Prozac. She had expressed wishes to die. Uh, and she was at, at home with constant monitoring by family members. But one day when mother was on the phone, she slipped out of the home, went to the Chicago subway station and jumped in front of a train, uh, obviously a victim of uh, psychosis or severe depression. Um, his, and Jennifer's mom established a foundation called uh, Jennifer Hartling Foundation for Postpartum Depression. And uh, our team at Mercy had uh, good fortune to work with the foundation. Uh, we did several conferences in early 2000 to increase the awareness about the depression. At one of these conferences, we had invited a prominent chair of OBGYN at a prominent test cost institution. He shared his personal story and said that they had gotten a new baby and things were going well for several months. But one day when he came home from work, he found his wife missing and learned that she had committed suicide, another victim of postpartum psychosis. So this chair of OB could not uh, recognize the signs of depression in his own uh, spouse. The third case is, and that was also in middle uh, 2000. This is a very recent case um, mentioned in JAMA uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And this is a case of a med pits physician um, and the third baby for this mom who needed to be hospitalized for enteroviral meningitis at three weeks of age, uh, recovers and gets discharged. But mom suffers from uh, extreme anxiety symptoms, multiple visits to the emergency room for minor complaints. And she herself describes her, um, her symptoms as a warrior. Um, she had a lot of trouble finding a therapist who could help, uh, especially the therapist who focuses on postpartum health. Uh, after a long time, she gets an appointment with psychologist <clears throat> who doesn't take insurance, but she still goes to her psychologist and recovers with cognitive behavioral therapy. And in her own words, um, she says that I probably was always an anxious person, but with this uh, uh, kind of problem with the child, uh, it became impossible to ignore the anxiety. And uh, she says that uh, anxiety and depression is pretty common. Um, she had hard time going back to work um, and she wonders what policies are needed to help parents transition back to work, including those who return with postpartum mental health disorders. And with these three cases, what I <clears throat> want to emphasize is that this is a 15, 20 year journey from uh, Jennifer Hotling presentation, which incited uh, routine screening. And today, uh, we know that the screening and treatment has improved a lot over 15, 20 years, and it has gotten um, good benefits. Uh, the incidence has declined by 25% in 27 states, uh, which report this data. But still, in spite of uh, <clears throat> this, CDC uh, still mentions that PPD remains common amongst new mothers. And still one out of nine new mothers 
still develop postpartum depression or peripartum depression. And this was written in 2017. So let's uh, <clears throat> just clear up any misconception on what is depression, what is anxiety, because there are several um, uh, mental health issues during pregnancy and postpartum period. Um, depression and anxiety are the main ones, and that's what we are going to talk about. So depression uh, is one of the most common complications of pregnancy. Uh, these symptoms begin during the pregnancy period and then can continue up to one year postpartum or even develop as late as six months to a year postpartum and has a lot of negative impact uh, on the family members. Anxiety um, uh, in the March 30, 2020 issue of Time was mentioned as a silent epidemic amongst American mothers. It's debilitating but normalized and even socially sanctioned. And the plea was that it be recognized as a serious problem in American motherhood uh, because it's even more common than postpartum or peripartum depression. The incidence is high as 17%, 2013, 2016. So pretty common um, problem. And these are not just uh, problems in US moms. Uh, and women in low and middle income countries experience a much higher burden of this dis disorder, as high as 48, 49%, as Dr. Murthy mentioned. Uh, and these are published published in 2020. Um, so there have been a lot of recommendations made over the years. Um, the first one was American Academy of Pediatrics, which uh, came out with recommendations in 2010, uh, which were reconfirmed in 2015 and now in 2019. American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology published um, guidelines in 2015, 2017, and 2018. Uh, US Preventive Services Task Force published guidelines in 2016, 2019. There are a number of states which have legal mandates on practitioners to screen for peripartum depression. And the commonly used tools are the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale, which is the easiest tool for mothers to fill out on their own based on their symptomatology, or public health questionnaire two or nine. Now one might wonder, why can't I just ask the mom whether uh, there are symptoms of depression? And the studies have shown that if you just ask cursory questions, you will miss more than 50% of cases. So one needs to use validated screening tool and EPDS is a tool that has been validated for best postnatal use. It has been um, um, translated into a lot of languages, almost six to eight Indian dialects, including Gujarati, Telugu, Punjabi, et cetera. Um, but all this screening, recommendations until now has only dealt with depression, has not mentioned anything about the anxiety. So why is depression and anxiety so much important? What are the impacts uh, from depression um, on various um, uh, uh, moms and babies? So if mom has an untreated depression during pregnancy, there is an increased risk for preterm delivery, low birth weight, growth restricted babies. Uh, also, if there is a pre existing depression, either during pregnancy or even before pregnancy, there is 50 to 62% risk of a postpartum episode. And then there are questions that people ask um, how does it affect the fetus and how does the treatment affect the fetus? <clears throat> the issues with depression during the postpartum period, a lot of uh, impact on the babies uh, uh, and moms, poor parenting skills, attachment issues, long-term issues like school performance, 
lifelong deficit in coping and interpersonal skills, poor compliance with well child care. So these mothers don't really go to the regular pediatrician visits and get well child care, but they go to the emergency room for getting the uh, well child care. Um, and um, there are questions about the medications that we use to treat and breastfeeding issues. Uh, there is an economic impact. And the next slide, I will have the dollar figures. Um, what is the cost to the society? Uh, also, there are studies which suggest that for the first three years, there are um, respiratory infections um, uh, prevalence. Uh, growth is impaired in first year, breastfeeding issues, substance abuse is much higher. And the national economic cost has been calculated at almost $14.2 billion over five years as an average of $32,000 for each mother-child pair. Uh, California alone estimated the cost to be $2.4 billion with a B per year. So um, what I have presented so far is that uh, there are issues that are short-term, there are long-term issues with the child's growth and uh, cognitive development, and there are economic costs to the society. So uh, on the anxiety side, the bad effects are more or less the same. Um, but if you know, if you recognize that mom has anxiety problem, then uh, it is strongly associated with depress depression or depressive symptoms at five days or six weeks postpartum. Um, and actually, as I said earlier, it is a much more common problem than depression. There is also an increased uh, incidence of low birth weight and preterm births. Uh, there is also increased risk of mental health disorder in the child. And most recently in last year or two, uh, the studies are coming out which suggest that uh, with anxiety during pregnancy, there is altered fetal programming and altered neural connectivity of the brain in the womb. So this um, causes long-term issues. Uh, about 60% of women with depression have pre-existing psychiatric disorders, and 80% of these are anxiety disorders. What is not known is whether you treat anxiety during pregnancy or early postpartum period, whether the long-term uh, outcome gets better. With depression, we know that early screening and early treatment the outcome does improve. Uh, with anxiety, we still have to do those studies. Um, the other problem with anxiety is there is not a good screening tool like uh, EPDS is for depression, but there are some questions from the EPDS which can indicate anxiety feature. Uh, or one can use the general anxiety disorder tool, but still it's not uh, as well validated as EPDS is for uh, depression. Um, now the question is, uh, should we add anxiety to routine depression screening? And the study has shown that um, when they did that, um, they did, um, identify moms who would have been otherwise missed by depression screening, but the difference did not reach significance. But the highest utility of adding anxiety to the screening is for those who have mental health diagnosis, mental health disorder diagnosis and history of substance abuse. But we still need um, more research to fully understand the utility and cost of the screening. Uh, but it may well represent a worthwhile addition and uh, maybe an important tool in combating peripartum mental health disorders. But we have only talked about screening and screening 
by itself doesn't really improve the perinatal outcomes. Screening has to be followed by systems that are in place to ensure consistent screening with appropriate assessment tools, interventions, and monitoring for women with identified perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. If we just screen and we don't have this linkage established for intervention and monitoring, actually we are doing a disservice to the uh, community rather than helping them. So in 2017, the uh, obstetrics and gynecology group uh, came out with a um, guideline which suggests that we use consensus, consensus bundle uh, for perinatal depression and anxiety. And the guidelines are not really new, but uh, it pairs the existing recommendation with resources, uh, as I mentioned earlier. And they focus about 14 areas, and there are four main domains. Uh, and the four main domains are readiness, uh, recognition, and prevention, and two others uh, I will mention in, in the next slide. So the readiness um, um, domain uh, looks at the screening tools, educates the staff, identifies an individual who is going to be responsible to drive adoption of the plan. And the recognition and prevention talks about the mental health history, uh, validated screening at appropriate timed encounters, awareness education to women, family, and support people. And um, the next Two domains are response and reporting. The response addresses the issues for somebody who treats, who turns out to be positive for screening, and how do they get referred to emergency support um, for suicidal or homicidal ideation. Uh, it also includes support for women, family members, and staff. Um, the reporting and systems learning talks about monitoring these women who have been referred for uh, treatment. So uh, these were the recommendations made by obstetric and gynecology, uh, and it went beyond just screening and recommended um, uh, linkage uh, with the resources. In 2019, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics extended their guidelines also uh, because um, even though the screening was recommended earlier, in 2013, their survey showed that only 50% or less screened the mothers for depression. And even today, it is higher, but not terribly higher. Uh, and they are suggesting that there should be training and CME programs for pediatric providers so that they are familiar with PPD screening, referral, and community resources. So they came up with two models uh, for treatment of peripartum depression in primary care, uh, screen and refer or screen and treat. Um, now, the barrier is that many pediatricians feel that they are not uh, trained in this uh, topic and mother is not their patient. Their patient is um, uh, baby. But uh, we all know that uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, suggests that the uh, support is needed for mother baby tired and not just for the baby. So the 2019 recommendations is little more clear than the 2010 and 2015 guidelines. And they are suggesting that the pediatric medical home do a better job at coordinating women's care with depression. And the screening should be done at one, two, four, and six months well child visit. The pediatrician and primary care provider is an excellent position to do this because the obstetrician only sees the mom 
for one six week uh, postpartum visit and then there is no uh, interaction between obstetrician and the mom. <clears throat> so there are much greater chances of this issue being missed. Uh, just recently, uh, the uh, state of Illinois is recommending that moms be seen um, earlier, like one or two weeks uh, postpartum and then at six weeks, but it's still limited to two uh, visits. So primary care provider uh, is in a good shape to see the mom and the baby and even father uh, <clears throat> for the uh, well child care. And the pediatrician should discuss the, with the mother's primary care provider wherever and whenever appropriate. And then the pediatrician doesn't have to treat unless he or she feels comfortable but the main job would be to re refer the mom for community resources uh, and the resource much must be appropriate. The other job that the pediatrician can do is provide breastfeeding support. Um, and if the mom is on any antipsychotic treatment, determine the most appropriate uh, medication that is not affecting breastfeeding and not affecting the newborn. So uh, pediatrician and neonatologist have a much greater role to play. Um, now there are some special issues with special um, population that uh, we should talk about. And uh, these have not gotten as much emphasis uh, uh, until about maybe 10 years ago. And even now, the emphasis is still uh, needed. Uh, the number one is paternal depression, then parents whose babies are in an ICU uh, for illness or prematurity, uh, mothers who bring their babies to the emergency room, uh, and COVID-19 affected women and the global impact. So basically what we are saying is that we need to serve the whole family with effective interventions so that we are supporting the well-being of children. And this is consistent with family-centered care and family-centered approach. Um, so let's talk about fathers. Um, um, and any depression in the father that occurs during the first year of baby's birth is considered uh, paternal depression. And there are few studies, but the prevalence has ranged widely from 2% to 25%. And that is because uh, we have to find an appropriate tool and appropriate time to screen these fathers. Um, the fathers who are at greater risk are those who are younger, uh, of lower socioeconomic status, and who have history of depression. And especially fathers um, where mom is having depression, there is a much higher chance that the father could be depressed as well. Um, there is limited research and um, some symptoms are common between mother's depression and father's depression, like depressed mood and loss of interest. Um, but fathers tend to show depression um, um, by increased irritability and uh, substance abuse. Uh, and paternal depression also is linked with poor outcome in children and families. Um, and the paternal depression can actually last as long as 18 months, uh, uh, which is different than maternal depression. Um, fathers are less likely to seek help for depression, uh, but providers need to make sure that both parents uh, are educated. Pediatricians have better opportunity to screen and educate during pediatric visits. Um, at least at some of the visits, fathers do accompany the moms and at that time, uh, an effort must be made 
who um, screened the father and educate the father. And the EPDS is reliable and valid for fathers, but the cutoff is two points lower than the cutoff for mothers. So um, paternal depression is important. It has not received as much uh, uh, attention as uh, it should. The second uh, group of special population is the babies who are in an ICU uh, and their mothers. And these mothers do have a higher incidence of not just depression and anxiety, but also post-traumatic stress disorder and obsessive compulsive disorder. And even though the incidence is much higher, only one out of 10 women receive treatment. And uh, these moms represent a situation which is um, a missed opportunity to screen and treat. Uh, there are relatively fewer studies. Uh, most studies have come out in last uh, seven or 10 years. And the incidence across the board is on an average 25%, including our own uh, study at Mercy Hospital. Um, and the NICU nurses are the ideal uh, individuals to help with this situation. Uh, there are three studies I would uh, mention uh, which have looked at the NICU-based intervention. And this particular study from 2017 um, looked at meta-analysis of 10 randomized studies and concluded that um, uh, the potential intervention benefits the depressive symptoms but they did not see much benefit with the anxiety. Uh, but they're cautioning that this should be <clears throat> interpreted as lack of evidence of effect rather than evidence of no effect. And we still need more studies. This particular study in 2019 looked at four uh, interventions creating opportunities for par parent empowerment. And what we found in our study at Mercy, um, which was published in 2013, um, uh, we noticed that uh, one of the biggest response that the moms gave was that they felt powerless, they felt helpless, they felt that they have no uh, contact intervention or say in baby's care. And so this particular study looked at uh, empowering the moms uh, so that they feel um, helpful. Uh, and others are family nurture intervention, transaction program, family-based intervention. And these, ben these interventions were shown to be beneficial, not only to decrease depression at discharge, but also when the baby is one, two, and four months old. And then this one, uh, which is called listening visits. Um, and Dr. Sekres at University of Iowa, she's a psychologist. Uh, she has been studying listening visits um, for over 10 years. Uh, this is being used uh, very routinely in European medicine where the home visiting nurses go to mom's home, screen the moms for postpartum depression. And then if the mom tests positive, then they deliver the um, listening visit therapy. Um, so it is a point of care treatment. Um, we all know that psychiatrists are in short supply and um, we have to find uh, treatment that uh, is easier for the parents. Uh, what is listening visits? It's an active, reflective listening and collaborative pro problem solving. It's a six visit program, uh, each one um, uh, lasting about an hour or so. And sessions one and two focus on basically birth, infant's health, and then shifts to maternal needs. And three, four, and five focus more on personal interaction exploring maternal thoughts and generate plan of uh, action. And the sixth and final session focuses on successes, 
bringing closer to intervention and therapeutic relationship. And um, this uh, listening visit has been studied in an open trial in Children's Hospital Iowa and also in a randomized trial and found to be beneficial. Um, we did um, try to use this uh, listening visit uh, protocol at Mercy Hospital in a research format, but um, uh, we could never complete it uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, but um, this is an opportunity for moms to be screened in the NICU and treated right in the unit by the NICU nurses who have a much better relationship with the parent. Uh, because referring the mom to somewhere else, there are lost uh, weeks or months, uh, and that could be detrimental. Emergency room represents another missed opportunity. Um, a mom who brings baby again and again to the emergency room for well child care type of uh, visit should raise a red flag. Mom who brings in the child for frequent respiratory infections <clears throat> should raise a red flag. And a couple of studies are in literature which suggest that about 15% uh, would test <clears throat> above the EPDS cutoff uh, when they get tested on a routine basis. Um, but not too many emergency rooms are screening at the present. And this <clears throat> is a good thing to do. How can we not talk about COVID? Um, and there are a um, couple of studies I will present. This is from last year where they looked at uh, 37 um, studies and uh, shown they have shown that the incidence of prenatal depression across the studies is 25.6%. And uh, the prevalence of prenatal anxiety across the studies is 30.5%. Uh, these numbers are from December 2019 to February 21. Um, this was done in an Italian uh, uh, hospital looking at Italian version of the impact of event scale. And more than half of the women rated the impact of COVID as a severe impact. And two out of three women reported higher than normal anxiety. And what they were anxious about was the worry about vertical transmission. And the impact was seen to be the greatest during the first trimester. The third one is from an antenatal clinic in Barcelona, where they studied 204 women and they examined the effect of lockdown scenario from the first wave of uh, pandemic. And they did show increased symptoms of anxiety and depression, uh, particularly for those who had limited social support. Um, Canada um, examined this issue in a longitudinal analysis of 1,301 women between May and July of 2020. And they did show increased prevalence and um, the priorities for these women was financial support, childcare provision and avoiding the closure of schools. And these issues uh, created an increase in psychological distress. Um, I mentioned earlier that this is not a problem just for the US, but it's also a problem globally. And um, uh, one technology that's very helpful in managing this issue in um, low and middle income country, even here, but uh, more so in those areas uh, where the women are living in rural areas is, uh, mobile phones um, to uh, have an improved outcome with increased screening and intervention. <clears throat> there are myriad of mobile phone applications for screening for depression, um, but the type and quality of information available lacks consistency, 
So there needs to be a better working collaboration between healthcare professional and the app developers. Um, now, I will focus on India mostly uh, because studies have been done all over the world, but um, uh, I will focus on India. And there are very few studies in Indian population, be it Indians in India, immigrant Indians here in US or US born Indian women. But the studies that have been published do indicate a higher incidence in India. Our study in the Anand district of Gujarat showed a rate of almost 48 and a half percent in hospital population. But it's important to do this study in community because significant number of women deliver at home in rural settings and they don't get subjected to screening. But on a public health note, what needs to be stressed is that the comprehensive public health program for perinatal mental health is yet to evolve and there are very, very few dedicated perinatal psychiatry services. Uh, one program that brought this uh, issue to attention is an international Marxist society meeting in Bangalore or Bengaluru in 2018. And this is a society of mental health care uh, providers. Um, um, and the things are looking little promising because the government is paying little more attention to the newborn health and public health system. And there is an increasing coverage of district mental health program to provide referral and training programs. And the mental health is also being integrated into existing mother and child programs. Uh, and they do recognize that there is a strong need to train all the healthcare providers. One such district level program that um, I can mention is the one initiated in Kerala uh, called Ama Manasu or Mother's Mind. And they did a randomized control trial and found that the community-based intervention was effective in reducing severity of depression. <clears throat> so they uh, incorporated screening into antenatal and postnatal visits, established referral pathways, and there already was an existing mother and child tracking system. So they incorporated the mental health data into this system for mother baby diets. And the national health mission is considering replicating this model in other states of uh, India. And uh, the WHO proposition that there can be no health without mental health has been endorsed by various uh, global organizations. Um, I'm going to enumerate uh, treatment modalities, but I'm not going to talk about the treatment in detail because each bullet point could be a lecture in its own. Uh, so I will just mention this treatment and the most common options are pharmacological and psychological. But unfortunately, one third of patients develop treatment resistance. And the safety during pregnancy and breastfeeding period also needs to be examined. Um, to the credit, uh, there are few new pharmacologic agents in last few years, and there are other interventions that need to be tested, namely diet, nutrition, exercise. Ketamine and Bexanolone were approved by FDA just in last couple of years. Uh, there are beneficial effects noted of skin-to-skin -skin care or kangaroo care, breastfeeding, <clears throat> because these are oxytocin-increasing activities and modify the HPA axis. And also the role of alternative and complementary therapy like Ayurveda, bright light therapy, yoga, talk therapy, and many others. Um, but I would mention that uh, all these uh, therapies um, do not have a good evidence-based background in the research studies. So there needs to be a strong research done for uh, 
all these other options. We so, have four more, four more minutes, Dr. Vasa, so we can have uh, some question and answer session yeah. too, you know. Sorry to yeah. interject, we'll be, but thank you. No, we'll be done in four minutes. Um, so the now focus is shifting from treatment to prevention. Until now, we mentioned only treatment and screening, um, but the 2019 uh, uh, recommendations are addressing prevention, and that's a shift in focus, <clears throat> which is, and prevention is a core principle of public health. Um, the prevention of depression is key to improving the health of our mothers and children, uh, but the implementation would require strong or stronger integration and collaboration between primary care medicine and behavioral health services. Um, until now, there were no existing guidelines which uh, made any recommendations for prevention. Um, and the USPSTF reviewed 50 studies and found that the counseling-based interventions can be effective in preventing perinatal depression, although most evidence was limited to women at increased risk for perinatal depression. Other intervention approaches provided some evidence of effectiveness, but there was no robust evidence based and need for the research. But the place where there is a research gap is that we don't know which women at increased risk of perinatal depression would most benefit from prevention intervention. So the USPSTF concluded that uh, with moderate certainty that providing or referring pregnant or postpartum women at increased risk to counseling intervention has a moderate net benefit in prevention. But there are challenges. Challenges are that, uh, as I mentioned, there is no accurate screening tool for identifying women who would most benefit from intervention. And counseling-based intervention and CBT requires extensive education and training. And uh, delivery of these interventions to a large number of women presents a challenge. So, if the healthcare system can make the necessary investment to implement these recommendations, they may return great dividends in the form of enhanced well being of mothers and offspring. So, in summary, what we learned today is uh, we discussed definitions, incidence, impact of depression, uh, consensus bundle guidelines, special population, and their special problems treatment and prevention recommendation. But what we did not discuss is also as extensive, and that is pathophysiology of peripartum depression, details of antipsychotic therapy, details of behavioral therapy, details of alternative and complementary therapy, and the research gaps and directions for future research. Uh, so all these things are equally important. It's an extensive topic, and hopefully at some point uh, this would be covered. Um, so thank you to API, Mercy Hospital team, our project collaborators in India, and future uh, collaborators. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vasa, for a very informative presentation on such an important, albeit, under-addressed epidem epidemic among women. Now, I think Dr. Chamata will, Chimata will uh, moderate the question and answer session. Uh, I am just asking one simple question. Uh, do you have any information regarding any specific government-funded national project addressing this uh, epidemic in any country? Uh, England, anywhere, you know. Yeah, actually, European countries do a pretty good job. Um, and partly it's because it's a nationalized health service. And um, I will also interject with my personal opinion of the same. Um, uh, the society has made a uh, kind of an acceptance that we are ready to pay more taxes as long as government takes care of our problem. And 
what that does is that the pregnant women get uh, free transportation for prenatal care. Uh, they get good service from home visitor base. And as I mentioned, they get screened for postpartum depression routinely. They get point of care treatment by visiting nurses with listening visits. And all this um, uh, help uh, provides quite a bit of benefit in terms of uh, mental health. Uh, uh, so that's one good model. Australia has also done a good um, set of national guidelines. Uh, and that includes not just the uh, regular population, but also includes the Aborigines. Uh, uh, so it's an all-encompassing uh, guideline. So Australia, England, I think they have done a pretty good job. India is moving in that direction, but still there is a lot of work that needs to be done. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Chimpata? Thank you. That was an amazing presentation, Dr. Vasa. Thank you so much for sharing all that information. Um, so uh, we have a few questions. Uh, there were several questions regarding more specific treatment protocols uh, for peripartum depression. So I'm going to mention the questions and, and you can comment as indicated. So um, there was a question regarding rexanolone IV infusion, which is the uh, patent name for pregnenolone. Um, and um, a comment also that it, it actually increases estradiol. That's its, its mechanism, one of its uh, downstream effects. So it, do you have any further comment on its use, on, on its efficacy? Sure. <clears throat> there are three, three agents. Uh, one was in uh, ketamine, then there is a nasal spray ketamine version, and then there is the vexinol or the IV therapy, the, which is uh, Zulreso, I think uh, that's the trade name. And the problem with Zulreso is that it has to be done in a hospital setting because there have been some uh, side effects uh, of syncope mm -hmm. and mom passing away and episodes of ethnic spells or cardiac arrest. Um, and uh, the IV infusion needs to be done under strong cardiac monitoring. Uh, it's a 60 minute uh, IV infusion and generally, uh, most of the time, one infusion takes care of the problem, but sometimes uh, moms may need additional uh, therapy. Uh, but again, this uh, limits um, kind of an uh, access to the hospital. Uh, the ketamine uh, spray actually is promising uh, uh, but uh, I don't have much experience. Um, and uh, IV ketamine is the same way. It needs to be uh, done in a hospital setting as well. But at least with ketamine, we have a long uh, history of safety, so to speak. Whereas with uh, Zulreso, we don't have a long history of uh, safety. Thank you, and I'll, I'll just add a small comment regarding ketamine that uh, even that has to be administered at the very least in a clinic setting with someone monitoring vital signs for probably up to two hours to ensure that the person is stable before they can then go home. So it is, uh, it's not a, a short visit uh, to the doctor's office when you get right. ketamine. Um, and the other um, thing that strikes me is that I don't know of any data regarding a secretion of ketamine in breast milk. So I'm not totally sure about the, the safety profile regarding that. But of course, as we all know, ultimately, even if it means um, stopping breastfeeding, saving the life of the mother means saving the life of the dyad of the mom and baby. So perhaps that would take precedence in the end. Thank you for those comments. And I agree with those uh, comments. Um, so one of the other uh, questions that, or, or comments that came up is, um, uh, does postpartum or rather peripartum depression worsen with each subsequent pregnancy? Uh, 
Uh, I don't think um, <clears throat> I have the answer to that, uh, although the hypothesis is that uh, it's possible, but I uh, don't have any answer or I don't have any personal knowledge of any study which has looked at that. Um, uh, now, we did look at uh, that briefly when we did study in India, and we did not find any relation to the increased incidence with subsequent uh, uh, parity or gravida. Um, now, uh, another uh, thing with the Indian um, study is that we always think that the female uh, child uh, would increase the incidence of uh, depression because uh, male child is preferred. Um, uh, but in our study, we did not find that. Um, we found the uh, incidence to be equal between the male child and female child uh, situation. <clears throat> Dr. Swami now then has raised his hand, so I'd like to ask him to please comment. Can you unmute, your, unmute yourself, sir? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Rohit, a quick comment. First of all, uh, you are hereby awarded honorary faculty position in the Department of Psychiatry uh, <laughs> because you have, that was an amazingly scholarly presentation, my friend. I'm so proud of you. Uh, you. A couple of things that I wanted to quickly go over. Uh, one is, uh, I, I, I don't, I'm no longer practicing, but my last consult out of state uh, just in the last few months uh, was a young Indian lady who it was actually is in jail at the time I saw or did the consult uh, out of state who actually killed her baby, her infant baby, uh, as a part of a postpartum psychosis episode. So I just want to emphasize the degree of seriousness uh, of, of your lecture and the importance of what you're doing. Um, the, I wanted to emphasize the issue of screening for anxiety and depression. 50% of depressions present with anxiety. So it's a fine line. It's very difficult to tease out what is only depression, what is only anxiety, and what is separate. Uh, that's a very important part, and I'm, I'm so glad you emphasized it. But I want to just mention that to our audience, that trying to do that by itself is hard. And, and I think the screening method uh, for, I would say, across the board for most mothers would be essential. But certainly when there's a high risk, you should, you should think about it. The last issue I wanted to mention, of course, is the issue of medications, is that this is one area. You know, the, the thing we learn in medical school is do nothing when your patient is pregnant. Do not give any medications, stop all medications. Uh, I would urge that you consult with your, your OBGYN or your future pediatrician in terms of treating perinatal, uh, especially depression and pregnancy, uh, regardless of what time it is, uh, to, to balance the pros and cons of treating somebody aggressively with medications, vis-a-vis -vis stopping the medications with the idea of preventing any kind of child problems, but then putting the damn mother at great danger. So this is one of those fields where the pros and cons are very narrowly uh, measured, if you will. Um, lastly, but not leastly, the, the idea that I think fathers uh, <laughs> equally also get depressed uh, is something that is not written about, not much talked about. So I wanna emphasize that, uh, particularly when someone has a postpartum depression, sooner or later it begins to affect the father. Uh, and and they, because they're trying to cope with it, both the, the, the mother as well as the family dynamics. So uh, something that I, I, I have not heard in very many lectures before, I want to emphasize there was a pearl that, that I took home with me tonight, but I have a ton of other issues and questions. But Ruth, I'm going to leave you with uh, uh, excellent, excellent, excellent lecture. Thank you again, Radhika. Thank you, Vimuri, for organizing this. Thank You're you. I, thank you for your comments. And I agree with all the comments. One more, one comment about paternal depression is that, um, it generally develops little more gradually than the maternal depression um, and lasts a little longer. So the recommendation is that fathers be monitored for 18 months rather than just for one year. Thank you, Dr. Swaminathan, for those, um, for those comments and, and for supporting the, the pearls that we all got to hear tonight. Um, and, and thank you for mentioning postpartum psychosis because that's another piece, postpartum mania, psychosis, uh, in addition to depression. So all, all falling under mood disorders. Um, and I just want to mention a statistic that postpartum psychosis occurs 
in about one in 500 to one in 1000 deliveries. So it's relatively rare, but not as rare as we would hope. And the risk of that increase is if it happens once, the risk that it would happen again is, is very high. So um, in terms of, as Dr. Vasa has mentioned, screening is everything. Uh, so if we know that someone has had an episode in the past, then we really need to keep our finger on the pulse for that, that mom and mom baby diet. Um, and so uh, that's the final comment that I have to make. Uh, Dr. Vasa, is there anything else you'd like to add? I think we've covered all questions that were in the chat. One thing, yeah, one thing uh, I would add, uh, and I did not bring it up during the presentation, is the legal aspects of uh, postpartum depression. And Dr. Swaminathan brought it up, um, um, mom being in jail. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, this is a very, very slippery slope. Uh, and there is no common answer that, pertains to all situations, every situation is different. Um, but whether postpartum depression can be used as a uh, defense technique, uh, it's a very, very individual uh, situation specific. <clears throat> and every state has different regulations. So I would just add that to what I said earlier. Thank you. Uh, this is a phenomenal discussion. <laughs> Very impressive. So we are now nearing the end of the program and Dr. John Lagarda will honor Dr. Vasa as the distinguished API speaker. Dr. John Lagarda, your answer. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, Dr. Shemata, for excellent interaction. We really enjoyed it, your, today's program. And Vijay, can you put the clock on, please? Yeah. Dr. Vasa, Indeed, it's an honor for me to give this plaque to you today. Uh, AAPA, American Association of Physicians of Indiana, recognizes Rohit Kumar Vasa, MD, for his outstanding contribution to neonatology and uh, welcome him as a member of RP Distinguished Speaker Club, Sudhakar Janalagada, Vemur Murthy, April 21, 22. Thank you very much, sir, for your time and contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I thank all the participants. Uh, so, today, this concludes this program for today. And, uh, have a wonderful night. Bye.